Once upon a time, humans actually used to be highly interested in space. Under the threat of losing supremacy in our planet's immediate area, known as Luna or the Moon, we used to race the Ruskies up there until eventually the United States was the first to actually land on the Moon. And if you don't believe we went to the Moon, then I'm sorry it's terminal, and if you say we only won the space race despite having our tails beaten at every turn concerning satellites and actually, you know, getting into space first, well, go take that crap somewhere else because we were violently pro-American on this channel. We won the space race, it's just it is what it is. I'd like to see anyone else's flag up there right now, although I think the Indians actually do have something planned pretty soon. Although really it doesn't matter what you plant up there because of the radiation, the cloth is really being blasted with all the time by the sun. For at least the last 53 years that our flag has been there, it's been stripped of all its color at this point, and it should be completely white, which means it's actually now another country's flag, but I digress. Since we have now lost half the viewers on this channel, it's time to get to the actual topic because of those statements I just made. The United States had many more visits planned to go to the moon during the Apollo missions, reaching all the way up to Apollo 17 as these missions were conducted. Eventually, they were stopped altogether, and humanity would never really return back to the moon. Now, given the moon is a barren wasteland consisting of nothing but a trace atmosphere of sodium potassium, amongst a few other gases, until we actually start mining it for resources, there did not appear to be a reason to sink more money into the program to keep us returning to the moon. Which is tragic, because who knows what we would have had right now had we begun building a base up there back in the day. Missed opportunities, in my opinion, but maybe we'll turn that around in this lifetime. But what was strange is, even in our timeline, the missions abruptly stopped, and as mentioned previously, we just never returned. Interest in the moon seemed to all but evaporate as quickly as it feverishly started. The Apollo 18 missions seemed to have sealed the fate of humanity returning ever again. Landing and finding the Russians had already been on the moon, things did not work out very well for them. Finding blood in their return module, the Americans are attempting to figure out what could have possibly happened to them in this barren landscape, only to actually locate what did happen. Besieged by a small creature that could easily bypass suits and invade the body itself. These creatures would inject a toxin capable of inducing psychosis and other unfavorable tendencies concerning your lifespan. So in today's episode, let's talk about what was achieved, where these creatures came from, and what it does to your body shortly after injection. So for all those new here, you don't know the drill, but up on the screen will be a timestamp in order to bypass the summary. Let's be honest here, if you want to go watch this movie, it sounds like a really cool concept if implemented correctly. Unfortunately, I was able to figure out that time dilation while watching this is achievable and 90 minutes became what felt like a year. Put a helmet on if you want to go watch this yourself, but for all others, let's get into why nature keeps evolving crabs and why space crabs are something we should probably worry about more so since having just finished the Mass Effect trilogy again, because you really never know what's going on with the Asari and the issues associated with them. So we kicked this thing off in 2011. 84 hours of classified footage is uploaded to www.lunartruth.com. You're about to find out how little sense this makes, and also Lunar Truth is now just a defunct website. Tragic. But it doesn't matter because spooky happenings don't have to make sense as long as we get the footage. Also, prepare your eyeballs. This thing was filmed like it's 1974. Anyhow, a couple of astronauts are being sent up into space. It's a classified launch run by the DoD. The payload is classified and is supposed to be unmanned. Essentially, the whole project is designed to identify incoming missiles better than satellites. Also, Ben Anderson looks like stock Commander Shepard. Just thought I would throw that out there. Shortly after launch, apparently they were sent up there around Christmas. So we get the background building. That way when they eat it, you actually feel worse. They end up splitting up for some reason, going to separate parts of the craft, saying, see you in a couple days. Shouldn't they want to socialize with one another? Actually, wait, uh, I get it, because I've actually worked with scientists, and that's exactly what we would probably do. Carry on. At this point, landing on the moon, everything looks pretty good, actually. Goes off without a hitch. Aiming for the rim of a crater, if not coming in just a little faster than intended, it goes pretty well. Shortly after landing, the cameras are grabbed, the suits are donned, and they exit the module. We get information that they have landed at the south pole of the moon. The sun is low on the horizon, and that's probably going to be important later. Now, the chat events. They plan another flag on the moon, leave a picture of their families, and proceed to drop the payload off. But as they do, something hits the camera and power fluctuates within the module. They load up the payload into the rover and then take it towards the chosen crater. They now begin collecting geological samples as one of the astronauts remarks it feels strange as something moves within the shadow of the crater behind them. Heading back to the module, John is orbiting the moon and remarks how there is a lot of static on the channel as Ben and Nate discuss what to eat. After eating, they just end up going to bed as their astronauts on the moon and they don't have a jaunty tune to sing. Like four people are going to get that reference. So it's time to hit the sack and complete the mission on the morrow. While they sleep, power fluctuations continue to occur. Eventually the astronauts are awoken by some skittering outside the ship, as well as noises coming in over the radio. As the astronauts attempt to go back to sleep, they continue hearing the skittering noise as the camera zooms in on a rock that then moves. Spooky happenings. Ben now goes to film Nate as he says he never snores and we get a jump scare that's just completely dumb. As the astronauts get ready, 
ready for day two electric boogaloo, Ben asks if Nate is the one who put his samples on the floor from the moon. Looking at one another, they realize it's basically contaminated by earth bacteria at this point, so it's ruined. They bag it again, but wonder how it got there. But not for long, as then they head back out onto the surface to screw with the payload from earlier. Ben at this point notices tracks in the moon, having different boots than the NASA astronauts, and now can't get through to John orbiting or to the Department of Defense. Ben goes to investigate the tracks and finds whoever it was appears to be disoriented and circling. Cresting a crater ridge, they find a cosmonaut module and then find that their flag is laying on the ground. Entering the module, they see that the power is off and find nobody inside. They do, however, find scratches everywhere and ripped up wires. Powering up the module again, Ben continues to go and look around while Nate finds a lot of blood all over the place. Ben descends into a crater, using his flash from his camera before remarking that the ground feels softer. Also, they say the suits aren't rated for, like, crater cold, but isn't the point of a spacesuit supposed to keep you warm? Now bear with me because I haven't been to space, but I figure it was designed to protect you from both heat and cold. Maybe that's just me. Anyways, he continues flashing the crater, and that sounded weird, and he ends up finding the cosmonaut, completely desiccated with his helmet off. Why would he take his helmet off, you ask? Well, we'll be figuring that out very soon. Also, why would the astronauts not have flashlights? Sort of like why Master Chief lacks any sort of night vision ability in a suit 500 years in the future, yet ODSTs have it. You'd think they would do that with Spartans first. That was really off topic, so Ben begins investigating the body of the cosmonaut and finds something moving, so he quickly pulls his hand away. Where the movement was, he finds a rock. The helmet of the cosmonaut has also been broken into. Nate then reports back to Thomas on Earth that the Russians have been to the moon. Nate accuses Thomas of knowing that they were there, because back then it was a big deal. The Department of Defense had them land there for a particular reason, and now the astronauts are a little upset he spaghetti over this. Government lying to them? <laughs> no way, that never happens. The astronauts are a little spooked at this point, as Ben remarks, when he looks out the window, he gets the feeling that something is looking back. But they decide to go to bed for the night, although the moon is tightly locked to Earth, so days last a little longer up there. But as they sleep, the module is then jolted, and this causes Nate to wake up. As Ben looks outside, he realizes that the flag is now gone. They begin to assume that the cosmonauts are actually still alive, and it's time to prank him, John. The Department of Defense tells them that they suspect the cosmonauts are there, but they have no proof. The astronauts ask where the cosmonaut is, because they can't just leave him up there, but the Department of Defense says that he was the only one. Nate knows what's up, and says that they need to get out of here. But as they attempt to take off, a leak is sprung, and a power fluctuation happens. They end up losing their radio comms, and then something grabs the camera, and then flips over the rover. So they need to figure out what happened to the module at this point, so they suit up and head out onto the surface once more. As Nate checks, the hull is damaged, but he doesn't find any residue from a meteor. Nate then finds tracks in the moon dust that weren't there earlier as well. He finds the flag has been shredded and the motion camera is also now gone. Nate then begins feeling something inside of his suit, so he starts freaking out as we probably all would and we see something crawl across his helmet. A rock lobster if you will. Ben heads out to go secure Nate and finds that his suit has been in fact breached and now he's running out of oxygen. Getting him to the module, he's able to save him by repressurizing the craft. He asks him what happened but Nate does not appear to be able to remember anything. John calls back to Houston but they tell him to just stay in orbit. Nate begins discussing what happened, saying that he saw something in the corner of his eye, but he wasn't sure. He has no memory of yelling something was in his helmet. Taking off his shirt, there's a fairly deep wound. So Ben knows what's up and begins asking where the thing went, if not in the suit. It's coming from inside of your meat suit. Performing an emergency surgery, they pull the thing out, but it's just a space rock. I think I'd be maybe marginally concerned, more so because Ben recognizes this as one of his samples. Nate then grabs a hammer and smacks the thing, destroying it, and you actually hear it like yell when it does, but just remember, humans versus aliens, a few oogadugas will always work. Ben now suspects whatever is around them is emitting a signal and is blocking their radios. That's why they haven't been able to hear anybody else, but can hear the creatures, which is interesting and we'll discuss that later. Nate says that they are on their own and that they are the guinea pigs, which is why they were sent up here in the first place. As Ben and Nate leave the module, it shows that the ship is actually infested with these things. Nate appears to be struggling, as the previous wound is now spreading. Eyes are bloodshot and his body is having physiological reaction to whatever has embedded itself in him. So the DOD keeps lying to the astronauts now, which I'm shocked. I'm shocked! Eh, not that shocked. Nate now goes on to tell Ben that he's getting worse and that he has to leave him there. Nate is now looking extremely rough, actually. His brain is firing randomly as he's talking random nonsense about exploring and resting in peace on the moon, as well as the blood vessels in his eyes are extremely bloodshot and dilated. As Ben talks about what's happening, he then realizes that Nate is bleeding above him and is dripping down onto his forehead. The infection in his abdomen is now spreading quickly and Nate Nate is now becoming more aggressive towards Ben, telling him to never touch him. We get some just absolutely 
ridiculous camera face freak out thing that if not sped up or with sound effects would be hilarious. And then Nate films Ben like a total weirdo as something creeps across the camera, going for that paranormal activity effect, I think. But Nate then begins smashing the cameras, saying that they aren't going to watch them meet their end as Ben tries to stop him as he's destroying the craft. John continues to try and reach out to the astronaut as Ben attempts to reach out too. However, Nate destroyed the craft and the craft is now depressurizing. They put on their suits and then they just basically nope out of there. Nate still continues to have his jimmies rustled as he appears to be slipping into a deeper state of psychosis. Ben and Nate get on the rover and attempt to get out of there. Nate then freaks out and tries to jump off the rover as we see larger crab monsters in the distance. Ben is now completely on his own and following the tracks left by Nate. Eventually he decides to say nah and goes off before he actually ends up finding Nate wandering on his own near a crater. Nate tells him that this is where the things are coming from. In mid-sentence, Nate is then pulled into the crater by something as Ben goes after him using the flash on his camera. Just brilliant. I mean, you would catch me moon jumping at an incredible speed at this point. We now see that Nate is boned as the crab monsters are all over the crater. Ben panics and then runs out to the Russian craft to seek shelter from the crab army. Firing up, he repressurizes the module as basically it's all the same tech. He tips to call out to anyone, but it appears as though nobody is answering. Eventually, though, he gets a call from the Ruskies, but they appear to have a bit of a language barrier, but as he talks to them, the Ruskies then transfer him to the Department of Defense as apparently they are working together on this, and the Department of Defense says they can't bring him home because it's too risky as he's been infected, even though supposedly he hasn't, because Gooberman, am I right? Ben listens to the recording left by his son and comes to terms that the people who sent him on this mission are complete losers. John, however, gets through to Ben, and Ben tells John what's happening. John says, forget the DoD, start the Russian module, synchronize orbit into his space, walk to his craft. Ben is about to take off as Nate begins banging on the window with a hammer, telling him to let him in. His entire suit is crawling with these things as they start eating his face meat. Ouchies. We now see that actually Ben has been infected, which <laughs> woof. The DoD tries to tell John that he's been infected and orders him not to save him. The DoD says that he will be stuck out there if he doesn't call off the rescue mission. As Ben reaches orbit, a ton of crabby rock monsters begin attacking him, and I think I would abandon the mission at this point, but Ben isn't able to stop his ascent and runs straight into John, taking them both out. We now get your standard cover-up about how all these astronauts were actually taken out during like training exercises on Earth, and there definitely aren't any space crabs on the moon. And that we also brought back like 140 pounds of lunar rocks that were given to dignitaries all over the Earth. Look, all I'm saying is, I like our chances against these things if you could take them out with a freaking hammer. Also, I just want to point out something. If we never went back to the moon, how do we get the footage from the moon? It just doesn't make any sense. Anyways, moving on. So I believe the first thing we need to establish is where do these creatures come from, or did they originate on Luna? Because that possibility seems a little odd, and then move on to the adaptations, allowing their survival as a species, and finally the impact the toxin has on the meat suits of humanity. Because it's clear that their biology appears to be somewhat compatible with Earth biology for this toxin to actually work and move through our system, because on the moon, you probably don't get a lot of chances to take down a meal regularly. So first things first, why does everything keep evolving into crabs? Well, because crabs are probably just a superior form of life. Thanks for watching. Anyhow, to understand why these things are so aggressive, we must first come to understand if they actually even evolved on the moon in the first place, and to understand that, we have to talk about how life evolves over time and how it can even start. Simply to start, no, there were no way these crab monsters actually evolved on the moon. For life to begin, at least carbon-based life such as ourselves, we need water as it acts as an extremely good median for the formation of amino acids. Amino acids being the building blocks of essentially everything, and they must exist in what you probably have heard it called the primordial soup. This is a collection of somewhat acidic solutions, heat, electricity, and the actual components that will make up the amino acid chain. The running theory here is, is that in the ancient oceans of Earth, as lightning would strike the ocean, vents underneath the water would release this solution over time, and the combination formed the first amino acid chains that would go on to become proteins. Through here, over time, proteins would clump together, and with the right energy expenditure, this would become the very first cells. Now, obviously, the jump from inorganic atoms to cells sounds strange, and the biggest question is how? Well, obviously, we aren't exactly sure how. Some say intelligent design, some say by chance. Either way, we are composed of atoms which by themselves, as far as we know, have no inherent consciousness. Now, I say as far as we know because honestly, if we are composed of atoms and the universe is composed of atoms, perception may not be the end-all be-all consciousness. Basically, life is incredibly confusing and really doesn't make any sense if you stop and think about it. Watch for the movie summaries, stay for the science and existential internal crisis. But the key here to all of this, going from inorganic atom to organic cell, requires liquid so that the compounds can continue to mix and swirl and have outside forces act upon them to combine them in different ways, and that results in life. At least, again, that's the running theory. Without a liquid, there is no mixing. There is no way forward. To that point, I can hear you saying, though, well, it doesn't matter what sort of liquid it is. Titan has liquid hydrocarbons 
on its surface? And to that answer, actually, it does. But what's really interesting about Titan during uh, the Sol's red giant phase, or just our sun, it may actually become briefly habitable as it resembles an early Earth, if you didn't know. Anyhow, take other liquid metals such as like mercury or liquid ammonia at room temp or hydrocarbons at lower temperatures. The fact is, with water's polarization effect and its ability to stay liquid in a wide range of temperatures and acting as a neutral, well, at least somewhat neutral pH, this provides the ability for compounds to combine and be torn apart easily. Hydrocarbons, for instance, are not significantly polar, so anything that forms will likely not be remade into anything else because hydrocarbons are not strong enough concerning polarity and also the temperatures they exist at do not promote a lot of diversity amongst molecules. Mercury, for instance, is actually just not polar at all. So, you know, you take something like liquid ammonia, which boils away at room temperature. The fact is, is that for compounds to change, I know we're really getting into this and these are just the examples of liquids I've given you, but water acts literally as the perfect median for the formation of amino acids to create life. Any other liquid to just not provide the right environment based on temperature needed for to exist in that state or polarity. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? Well, after ancient Earth got run into by a protoplanet after the formation of our solar system, a large chunk of debris was flung out, which became our moon. Once it conglomerated over millions of years, cooled down and solidified, the reality is, is that no water ever formed on the surface. Not only that, but radiation from the sun would have easily blasted apart any compounds that may have formed. For this reason, no life could have formed there. Now, you may be tempted to think, well, Earth has caves. Why wouldn't the moon have caves with water, right? Well, the issue is that concepts do not mix, or at least the concepts from this movie do not mix in the way you would think. If caves of water existed on the moon, then those caves would have to be a completely closed system that was pressurized. If a hole was made anywhere, the local atmosphere would vent out quickly, which would lead to an evaporation of water inside. As for water to exist in a liquid form, it needs pressure. Which actually, this is pretty interesting. Water will boil and freeze at the same time as well as sublime. It's called a triple point. If at room temperature with no pressure, the boiling will release gas, but this will also cause it to cool, which will then cause it to freeze as heat is lost. If you've never seen what a triple point actually is, Matt, if you'll post a video pretty much about me talking of this, it is like super interesting as it almost appears water doesn't know what to do at that particular point. Anyhow, the pressurized cave would also have the effect of creating creatures that were not capable of living on the surface as they didn't evolve there. That would be like us climbing on Mount Everest without oxygen because we live on Earth. Just because it's near us doesn't mean that we are suited to that environment and the same is with the crabs. This also means that if they exited the cave, they would compromise the pressure as mentioned previously and destroy their own home. With this, I think we can assume at this point that they are not from Luna. Nothing about their evolutionary pathway or creation would make any sense in that respect. However, that said, it does not mean that they could not have evolved in an environment that would have given them adaptations that they needed to survive elsewhere. Based on these clues, what may have happened? It's clear that they evolved elsewhere, but in a much more hostile environment than that of Earth based on their ability to survive on the moon. The adaptations this thing would need to survive the environment of the moon indicates that likely this creature evolved on a planet or moon of its own at some point that was rocky based on its camouflage. The moon would have likely had a thin atmosphere, but enough to support liquid water, at least in some pools. What may have happened is the planet or moon had no magnetosphere, and as a result, over time, the atmosphere was slowly stripped away by the sun's solar radiation, which was then replaced by evaporating water. But this had an effect of slowly but surely making the planet more and more dry, allowing for the early evolution of these creatures, but potentially not a whole lot after that. Due to this evolution and likely short time frame for life to exist on this hypothesized world, likely a food web in comparison to ours was not established, which resulted in other adaptations needed for the crabs to survive, something that has actually evolved on this planet as well. For them to exist on the moon as a single species with no other prey seen or known about, this indicates to me that a form of photosynthesis must be taking place within them with a few leftover adaptations from their past. The leftover adaptations would be things like their camouflage ability. They straight up look like moon rocks. Because of this, they would have obviously used this to hide at some point, and those that were better at hiding survived, meaning that likely they were prey on whatever world they came from, but also, based on other adaptations, they did hunt. They appear to have huge claws, which they can attack and burrow into the bodies of astronauts as well, and then also break glass on helmets. This indicates that, much like crabs on Earth, this could be used in defense or in competition for mates, meaning that, again, they definitely evolved somewhere that actually had predators and prey. But seeing as the interactions were likely few and far between, photosynthesis would be required for them to survive with a meal coming by being really just an extra bit of luck. Sort of like that video where that horse eats that baby chicken. Horses are not carnivorous, but it still ate baby chicken because it was just there. Another adaptation would have to be the internal pressurization of the body. It would appear to me that the atmosphere continued to wane over time from where they hailed from. Pressure in the body would become paramount to their survival. The carapace they possessed would likely have continued to spread and 
seal more effectively to stop the loss of fluids, as essentially air from their bodies would be trying to just constantly evaporate into the atmosphere. This would be quite advantageous seeing as there is only a trace atmosphere on the moon, so they would almost be like their own suit, protecting them but still allowing them to collect nutrition and survive from photosynthetic interactions with our sun. The crabs do appear to undergo the process, also based on what we have seen them do all over the moon. They appear to be just straight sitting in the sun, not wanting to move. Now this is possibly due to the fact that their backs contain more minerals to protect them from the ionizing radiation from the sun that's blasted onto the surface of the moon constantly, whereas their legs, because they have to move, would contain less thick portions, meaning that the genetic coating of their bodies may be more vulnerable there as the sun literally just rips it apart. This causes them to not move when they are being handled or walked by as to protect their own bodies. They will move if it's an absolute emergency or if in the crater of an impact site as they are protected from the sun's rays there. This adaptation would have actually held from their own planet as more and more atmosphere was lost over time, allowing more radiation to seep in. And finally, the last clue as to where they evolved is the actual communication they had. It is seen throughout the movie that the astronauts kept picking up sounds of something chittering on their radios and subsequently could not reach out to John overhead who was orbiting. Because of this, it can be surmised that the moon crabs communicate via radio frequencies as well. Now, if you find this odd, I want you to remember to a degree most animals communicate by energetic waves, or at least can perceive them. Look at light. It's a higher order of radio waves for all intents and purposes if you want to look at it that way, but things in the ocean can actually perceive and communicate via electrical fields that their bodies produce. The thing about a vacuum is, sound is off the table as there's no compressional waves created as there's no air. Communicating by light would be effective for these crabs, but it just appears that their bodies adapted to receiving and sending radio waves within their bodies, which is just a less energetic waveform. While on Earth this doesn't exist, it's not impossible to think that a creature evolving on a world that was slowly becoming a vacuum would find ways in order to communicate with one another as sound was impossible. Which also means they probably didn't communicate by light because I didn't see any eyes on these crabs, but that would also be a point at which a vacuum could suck moisture out of. So potential electrical fields produced by them became less effective as water dried up, meaning that that was also not something that they would have had. All this allowed them to survive on their increasingly hostile world until ultimately something happened to that world. Given all the impacts on the moon, it's safe to assume some of these crabs from elsewhere were blasted out into space, likely from an impact on their own planet or moon, and then they just started drifting through space. They acquired adaptations that allow them to live on their world and subsequently the moon, and those are the same ones that allow them to survive on an asteroid as it drifted through space and then likely entered a state of hibernation until eventually impacting the moon without too much resistance from a trace atmosphere or lower gravity, the asteroid wouldn't have heated up that much, which allowed them to actually survive this impact. So yeah, that's uh, there's the whole evolutionary path the moon crabs laid out, which explains why they are even up there in the first place. Basically just a perfect storm scenario of survivability and luck. But as we have seen, the crabs do possess at least some predatory instincts, but is that active hunting or is that just a misunderstanding for the most part? Let's take a look at the predatory behavior real quick to discern why this interaction may have even happened. We see with space crabs that they range in size from small rocks that you can hold in your hand to large boulders that dot the moon's landscape. The larger ones appear more openly placed in the sunlight, but with that said, the smaller rocks are visible as well. The smaller rock lobsters appear to hang out in the craters, at least for the most part. This would say to me that this is almost like a tide pool scenario. The young are more protected by the crater, where the adults do not need as much protection as long as they stay still, so they move outside of the tide pool. They also do not even appear all that interested in humanity, like really none of them do. If you notice when the attacks happen on the module, it's almost shortly after using the radio and making a call back to Houston. It seems to me that this calling back is actively either hurting or annoying the adults. Because of this perceived pain, the adults will attack the module or what's around it to get it to stop. This may be because while the crabs communicate with one another via radio waves, it's organic and likely less powerful than the equipment used by astronauts calling back home almost 239,000 miles away. This overpowers their sensory organs and sends them into a rage, causing the attack in the first place. Secondarily, I don't believe even the young crabs are trying to attack. It looks to me like that one crab that was in Nate's suit actually is just trying to burrow into warmth. It seems like potentially this is what adults would do with their young as well, harbor them to a degree within the carapace before releasing them to run free. Free. It's possible these are newly released young, seeing as they are rather small compared to the adults, and as discussed, they're just seeking warmth again. Coming across a warm-blooded animal such as ourselves, they would begin burrowing once more. This is why when they are crawling across Nate's face in the end, they immediately end up attacking his face because they're just trying to get to where the warmth is, which unfortunately is also his brain. It's sort of like why a mom cat will just smack the crap out of a kitten when it gets old enough because it's trying to get milk. It's like, nah, free ride's over. But that doesn't mean kittens won't continue to try try on other animals. These things may make the crabs appear aggressive and bloodthirsty, but it really just comes down to two things. The first is the radio boosters we use
Ravens may literally be hurting the crabs and agitating them into attacking the module and rovers. And when Ben and Nate were talking later near the crater ridge, when Nate was yeeted in, they were using their radios, which were annoying the crabs also. Second, the young are just trying to stay warm and by doing so burrow into human bodies and also crack the face shield of suits because that would be like cracking into the carapace of adults to stay warm. This boils down to two species not really understanding the other, although likely humans are the more intelligent because humanity is going to always be number one. So the last point I want to cover is this. What is the toxin and what is the pathophysiology observed on the human meat suit and the chemoelectric anxiety machine in our brain case? Well, it's clear to some degree that this venom is a form of neurotoxin that enters the bloodstream and begins to wreak havoc. But what I find interesting is how long it takes, what it has set out to do, but also our body's apparent attempt to counter it. The typical way people think about neurotoxins is paralysis of the muscle in the body, leading to difficulty breathing, heart arrhythmias, until finally it flatlines you. But concerning the nervous system itself, things like damaged brain cells or motor neurons being inhibited are more in line with what I'm thinking, but basically brain cells specifically. It appears that there may be a type of interaction going on that either the crabs have not intended, or it may even be something like a venom that is supposed to be released in small amounts, but is done to several orders magnitude greater because they are young. So let me expand on that. Take a copperhead snake, right? Well, it is known that the adults actually control the amount of venom that they inject into a prey animal or in defense so that they don't run out of reserves in one bite. This is rather effective in case they do have to use multiple bites to bring something down or something just keeps bugging it. Whereas getting bit by a baby copperhead is way worse for your survival. All the venom is injected in one bite, releasing way more toxin into your body, leading to a quicker end if help is not sought out immediately. It's because baby snakes do not have the ability to control how much venom they release. And being down in Georgia, that's always a blast when I go running because this is Copperhead Central, so you really gotta avoid them, especially in the spring. Regardless, this is what I believe may be happening with the young crab monsters. The adults likely possess some form of venom to a degree, which means the young do as well. This would be perfect for paralyzing potential meals in an environment where you may not get a second chance to bolster your nutrition, even with photosynthesis. Because of this, it is inherently built into the bodies of the crab to produce this venom with the young, and upon burrowing and realizing that something is prey, biting it to burrow would also release this venom into the surrounding area, which we have seen based on the wounds of Nate. The other option is, is that the actual saliva of the crab contains compounds poisonous to humans just naturally, which we see something similar in Komodo dragons and monitor lizards. They do not have venom, but the bacteria in their mouths will take down prey days later as infection sets in, which is horrifying because there's actually stories of people being bit and then walking like 14 miles and like every time they look back, the Komodo dragon was following them. Like, Honestly, at that point, just craft a spear, take it out. No, don't follow me, let me die in peace. Anyways, this is possible seeing as the infection does appear to spread like an infection within Nate. Either way, as the infection or venom spreads, it appears to take a few hours for it to move past the site of origin, but once it does, it's clear it uses a circulatory system to infiltrate the body. We see the first signs are the actual black blood vessels. Much like when I covered Maggie, it's clear that this blackening is a result of leaky blood vessels. This can happen when macrophages come into contact with a foreign substance, in this case, an entirely new compound as this thing originated somewhere else entirely. And this will cause the macrophage to start calling for help. As the fight continues in the circulatory system with the toxin or microbes spreading, inflammatory signals are sent out, which causes the blood vessels to dilate as well as fluid basically rush into the area. And this will become what is known as a leaky blood vessel. Also damage to the blood vessels will cause it to be leaky too. Blood cells will spill out sometimes and meet their end just outside the blood vessel, which gives us the coloring as blood coagulates around the vessel. This is, however, a good indicator as to what's happening in your circulatory system. As the infection progresses, it seems like the immune system doesn't appear to know how to get a hold of this issue, at least with the innate immune system. It is possible that in the microbe, as it's released, the adaptive immune system may have a better chance, but it would take a few days of dealing with the invader, and even then, it's not assured that it would be able to deal with this, seeing as other issues begin arising within the body that would then begin to complicate things. As the infection progresses, eventually, due to the human circulatory system being a highway to the brain, the substance appears to make its way to the brain. Now, there are a few ways this can happen, and this makes me think possibly it really could be a microbe introduced into the bloodstream that is releasing a toxic substance as it circulates through the body, which may be the most effective route for the crab to bring down prey, as the body actually needs to get rid of the thing creating the toxin, not just the toxin itself. Moving around the body, it would likely bypass the blood-brain barrier, at least the toxin would, and then diffuse into the neurons themselves, disrupting the actual firing of the neurons, leading to a psychosis as more and more neurons were affected, but it also likely diffuses into the cerebral spinal 
fluid as well. The point here is, is that, well, I guess we got to get into neurology now. Essentially, psychosis is a non-natural way in which the brain functions. It can cause auditory and visual hallucinations, as well as aggressive responses to situations don't call for it, and a sense of fear and paranoia. Within the brain are these things called ventricles. The cerebral spinal fluid flows into these areas of the brain, which acts to dissipate heat and also pick up waste materials, which is then taken away from the brain. However, in something like schizophrenia, for instance, this area of the brain has the ventricles enlarged, indicating that the tissue that was once originally there is now gone. That's why medication is so important because it will slow this process down. As the ventricles enlarge, this over time has a worsening effect on the brain as gray matter is essentially destroyed, causing the brain to have to adapt and react in different ways. Now, something to note is the brain has other areas affected, but key areas associated with the most internal portions of the brain are highly affected. And if you know anything about the human adult brain, it does not like adapting. A kid's brain will adapt all day. An adult brain just it gives up. It's like, nah, I'm good. Kind of sucks to be honest with you. But the toxin upon entering the cerebral spinal fluid or CSF, because that's what I'm going to call it, will begin breaking down the cells that are closest to it as it's a neurotoxin. This also means the barrier that protects the brain from bloodborne pathogens can be bypassed as it enters the CSF and heads for the brain. Once enough of the brain is degraded, this would coincide with the physical display on the outside as well. As the toxin spreads in the blood, aggression levels begin to peak and muttering and incoherent speech can be heard from the infected. Eventually, logical thought is overridden as the interior of the brain is more and more eroded away with other areas likely hit as the toxin bypasses the blood-brain barrier. We can assume the dilated blood vessels seen all over the body would be the same internally as well, meaning that pressure is always being put on the brain by the expansion of these vessels, which has a habit of decreasing the effectiveness of the blood-brain barrier as well, seeing as the plates that protect the brain would be stretched out, which appears to have an effect on the activity of the brain. And again, this causes a more subdued effect because once you start destroying neurons, the brain just doesn't fire right, you know? Ultimately, this would be entirely fatal, it seems, like within about a day or two because only eight hours have passed from the time of the bite to the time where Nate was overcome by smaller crabs. Given just a bit longer, the person would become disorientated and then would have started to wander around confused and with limited oxygen and, you know, the moon is just known for its stellar safety record out on the surface. This would result in a person's end. Although it appears to be the crab's hunting method, which again, it's like what we see on Earth with other species that have the same hunting technique. And this confirms that the crabs are probably omnivorous as they have adapted the ability to hunt by destroying the brains of their prey. But this means to a degree that Earth biology appears to be somewhat built the same as space crab biology.